Now, if you would open your Bibles with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. As I have said when we was going through this passage, which is a clear and often quoted in the New Testament as a prophecy and a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ as the suffering servant, the one whom God sent. The Bible says in Galatians 4, in the fullness of the time, God sent forth his son made, under the law, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law. What did it take for Christ to redeem his people? And it's described right here in Isaiah 50. 2 and 53, the sufferings of our Savior suffered so much unto death. And we talked about this passage. The, the, actually, this passage here can be divided into to five, you might say, stanzas. I, I don't think it was written as a song or a poem, but it's kind of set up that way of three verses each, and we started back in Isaiah 52, verses 13, 14, and 15, because that's really where it starts. Uh, before that, in Isaiah 52, uh, Isaiah was prophesying of, of uh, uh, God's judgment, and but the fact that even in judgment, God was going to bring his good and his glory out of this through the salvation of his people, by his grace, Jew and Gentile, through the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he prophesies specifically of the sufferings of Christ as the servant of God, <clears throat> the servant of Jehovah, the servant of the covenant, he calls him in verse 13, my servant, and shows how he will deal prudently. He will prosper. The work of Christ on the cross was never a failure. For all whom it was intended, it was a success. It is a success. And in order for him to accomplish that, to put away our sins, and to establish righteousness whereby God could justify sinners, he had to suffer unto death. And so we spoke of that. And then the first three verses of Isaiah 53, we talked about the humiliation of our Savior. Christ, God the Son in, in, in uh the second person of the Trinity condescended to be made like unto his brethren, God in human flesh, yet without sin. What a condescension that was. And then the condescension, he was made under the law, the very law that was written with his finger. He made himself subject to the law, to obey the law unto death for the salvation of his people. The sufferings that he went through that he put up with between men, between sinners like us who, who mocked him. You read about that in Psalm 69. They, they made him a proverb. You know what that means? Literally, they made him a joke. And they spoke very lowly of him. The God of this universe. I often think about this, you know, the very cross that he was, he was nailed to. He's the one who created the tree that it came from. What condescension, what humiliation. Put a crown of thorns on his head. He's the king of kings. And yet they put a crown of thorns on his head. They beat him. And all of this <coughs> was, again, we have to look at it this way. It's not just those people back then who did that. It's, it's a, an act of the wickedness of fallen humanity, including me. I'll never forget years ago. There was a famous preacher up in Toledo, Ohio. And this was around the Easter season. He was talking about the death of Christ, and he was describing Christ vividly in his suffering. And what his goal was is to make people feel sorry for, for Jesus. That's what he wanted. And he started crying, and he made this statement. He's, he's talking about Christ carrying that cross, and you know how... It happened, he fell down and somebody carried it. He said, oh, our Savior, he said, he said this. He said, if I'd have been there, I would have stopped it. I thought, are you crazy? First of all, I'm going to show you here in just a few minutes. Everything that was going on there, even though we as wicked people meant it for evil, it was under the sovereign purpose and control of Almighty God. He thinks he could have stopped it. 
What a fool. And then secondly, what he was going through there, that's my salvation. How about you? What is your salvation? Is it in your profession? Walking an aisle in your baptism? If that's your salvation, you're in trouble. Christ is my, his name shall be called Jesus. For he shall what? Save his people from their sins. Well, that's the one described here in Isaiah 53. And today I want to talk to you specifically about the cause of his sufferings. What caused him to suffer unto death? Why did he have to suffer? Why did he have to die and be buried and raised again the third day? Well, look at verse 4. This is the, the third uh, stanza of this, this uh, construction, this writing, this song, if you will. And here's the reason why. He says, surely he, Christ, the Messiah, the promised coming Messiah, hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Now that's the first thing. What was the cause of his suffering? Now think about it this way, as I've been talking about. We could say that the cause of his suffering was the sin and hatred of sinful mankind against him. Let me read you a passage. This is out of Acts chapter 4, and I'll just read it to you. This is verse 26. Listen to this. It says, The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth, thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together. This is one time that all uh, people who, who naturally hated each other, this is one time they all came together in unison against God's Messiah. What does that tell you? That tells you this, is that by nature we're all against him, and I'll show you that in just a moment from this passage. If God leaves us to ourselves, we will always turn thumbs down on the Christ of this book. Now, false religion, false Christianity has created a lot of counterfeit Christ that appeals to the natural man, makes him feel good about himself, makes salvation conditioned on him to where he can boast that he made the difference and not God Almighty in his sovereign electing love and grace in Christ. But if left to ourselves, we'd all turn thumbs down on the Christ of this book. The way, you know, it's funny how people, they'll read the scriptures and they act, act like they never read what they read. I've heard people say, well, you know, Jesus, you know, he didn't go around judging people and telling them they were lost and all that. And, uh, you know, he just spoke kind of, uh, uh, who, who said this? You vipers. You hypocrites. Outwardly, you look like a whited sepulcher, but inside you're full of dead, rotten bones. Now, who said that? Jesus of Nazareth said it. He's the light, isn't he? Scripture says he's the light. What's the problem with us by nature? We hate the light because his light exposes our deeds, the things that we're so proud of. The things that we think really make a difference between us and the rest of those ornery people. He says they're evil deeds. Because you see, if we plead before God anything less than the perfect blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ, in God's sight it's evil because it dishonors him. Bring your best. Bring your best. What does the Bible say? Man at his best is altogether what? What does it say? Isaiah 53. Vanity. Worthless. God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. <laughs> Without faith, it's impossible to please God. What is that faith? It's looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. It's not our believing. It's him. It's, it's, not, it's not the act of believing. It's the object of our believing, who is Christ. Think about that. Well, here it is. He says it here in Acts 4. He said, against his, 
child Jesus. So we could say, well, the sinfulness and the hatred of humanity against him, that's what caused his suffering. But then in verse 28 of Acts 4, it says this, listen to this. All these people gathered together against God's Messiah for to do whatsoever God's hand and God's counsel determined before to be done. Wow. Wrap your mind around that one. You can't, can you? You know why you can't? Well, don't get mad, but you're not God. You're not God. Like that old false prophet, a Catholic priest said, he said, I don't know anything more than other than two things. He said, I know there is a God and I ain't him. Well, that's true. There is a God and we aren't him. We know that Christ was the innocent victim of evil humanity. Peter said, who by wicked hands took him to crucify and slay him. But then Peter made this statement. He was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. And look, look across the page here in Isaiah 53. Look at verse 10. Listen to this. But yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. You know what that word bruise really is? Crushed. It pleased the Lord to crush his son. He hath put him to grief. The Lord hath put him to grief. When the Lord shall make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord, the satisfaction of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. What is that telling? Is, is that saying that God is some kind of a sadistic monster who just loved to see his son suffer and bleed? No. Not at all. There was a purpose in this. And when, you know, when we consider the cause of Christ's suffering unto death, we can think about second causes, we can think about third causes, but there was a first cause. Many people today would say that the first cause of his suffering was God, would be God's love for us. And they quote passages like John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And certainly God's love for his people was involved in this. But if you don't see more than this, you'll miss it. You know, most people think uh, that God loves them because they deserve God's love. And the fact is, none of us deserve God's love. That's right. None of us deserve it. God's love is sovereign. And so you have to ask yourself, why, you know, all right, if you say, well, God loves his people and he sent Christ to die. Well, ask yourself, why would God's love require such suffering? I mean, think about this. I heard a man say one time from the pulpit, he said, God didn't have to send his son to suffer and die. He could have just snapped his finger and redeemed us. Oh, no. No, that's wrong. That's a false, false portrayal of God. Why would God, look, look at verse 14 of chapter 52. Listen to this. As many as were astonished or astonished at thee, his visage, that's, that's how he looked, was marred more than any man. <laughs> Unrecogn he was beaten so bad, he was unrecognizable physically. His form more than the sons of men, more than anybody else ever. I don't know what that's like. But why would God's love and the salvation of his people require such suffering unto death? I'll tell you exactly why. It's because of God's justice. You know, the Bible says in Psalm 9 and verse 16 that the Lord is known by the judgment which he executed. If we are to know God's love, God's true love, not just some human elusive butterfly. If we are to know God's grace, God is a God, you know, God is a God of love. The Bible says he is love. If we're to know God's grace, God's mercy, when you were playing that, that song, Amy, great is thy faithfulness. I always think it's Lamentations chapter 3. You know what that says? It says, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. 
Great is thy faithfulness. If we're going to know God's mercy and grace and love, we must understand as the Bible, as the gospel itself reveals, that all these, his love, his grace, his mercy, reign through justice satisfied by Christ. And that's the glory of God. There's the first cause of the sufferings unto death. God must be glorified. Yes, God loves his people. Yes, God saves his people. Yes, God has mercy. His mercy endures forever. He delights to show mercy. His grace is, is so uh, amazing grace. But every bit of that, Every attribute, God's love, God's grace, God's mercy, must be shown, executed, delivered on a just ground. And the first and immediate cause of Christ's suffering unto death was the glory of God. Whatever God wills and whatever God does, he must be true to himself. He must honor himself. He must remain true to every attribute of his nature. He can't show his love to a sinner apart from justice satisfied. He cannot be gracious to a sinner apart from justice satisfied. He cannot show mercy apart from justice. As Isaiah said in Isaiah 45, he must be both a just God and a Savior. That's his name. That's his glory. Most people today have never even heard of that and never even thought of it. I remember years ago, Randy, you said, well, I've never thought of those things. I said, well, that's the problem. You never thought of them because you're not hearing them. But that's who God is. He's a righteous judge as well as a loving father. And if he can't be both, then all he is is a righteous judge. And we'll be damned for it. God must be just when he justifies. So if God is going to save sinners in love and mercy and grace, he can only do so on a just ground. And it's God's glory. There is a way that God alone devised in his goodness, his power, his wisdom. And it's the way of grace that reigns through the righteousness of his son. Romans 5.21, as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness. Justice satisfied, that's what righteousness is, perfection of the law, satisfied. Grace reigns through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Think about that. Listen to 1 John 4.10, herein is love. Not that we love God. In other words, God's love to his people is not a response to, to their love for him. God loves the unlovely. God justifies the ungodly. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and did what? Gave his son to be the propitiation for our sins. You know what propitiation means? You ever looked that word up? I, can't, I, I just about bet you that most people who call themselves Christian today don't even know what propitiation means. And you sit around in most Sunday school classes, they'd say, well, now, brother so-and-so, what's your opinion of that? Well, who cares what your opinion is? What does it mean? I'll tell you what it means. It means justice satisfied. That's what it means. God's love sent his son into the world to do for me what I cannot do for myself. What can I not do? I cannot put away my sins. I can cry for months. I can pray until the pant leg, the knee pads of my legs are worn out. I can, I can get baptized, to, as one old preacher up in Kentucky said, till the tadpoles know me by my first name. I can go to church I can walk an aisle, but I cannot wash away even one sin. That's right. I cannot 
obtain or attain or I cannot achieve a perfect righteousness that answers the demands of God's law. I can't do it. I can turn over a new leaf. I can reform my life. I can stop this, start that, join the clubs. But I cannot attain perfect righteousness. Can't do it. The Jews tried it, Romans chapter 9. They sought righteousness by works of the law. They didn't make it. How is all this possible for his people? How is it accomplished for his people? Not just made possible, but actually accomplished for everyone for whom Christ died. We'll look at it. Verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs. Surely he hath carried our sorrows. You know what that speaks of? That speaks of a surety who took my place. Substitution. The gospel of substitution. When we think of Christ's suffering, we must consider it as a vicarious suffering, a substitutionary. He stood in the place of others. And when we think of Christ's suffering unto death, we must think of it as a complete suffering because his death was not just an attempt to save those who would cooperate or who would believe or who would let him. His death was the assurance that they would believe. Christ bore and carried the griefs, the sicknesses, the diseases. You know, in Isaiah chapter 1, he metaphorically describes the sin of the nation Israel under, under the metaphor of leprosy. Ah, sinful nation. And what's interesting about that is he's talking about religious people. He's not just talking about the dregs of society. He's talking about those who are praying, who are bringing sacrifices, who are having meetings, but it was all in ignorance of how God saves sinners. It was all in ignorance of the grace of God in Christ. It was all thinking that I'm doing something to make the difference between being lost and being saved. But here's the issue. Christ carried our griefs and our sorrows that we deserved and earned. Christ died for the sins of his people. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, I delivered unto you first of all how that, uh, all that I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Well, here's one of those scriptures that Paul's referring to. Galatians 1, 4, talking about Christ who gave himself for our sins, the sins of his people. Who are his people? Believers. 1 John 2, 2, he's the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That's not talking about every individual without exception. That's talking about God's elect all over this world, Jew and Gentile. How do you know who they are? They believe. They hear this gospel and believe in the power of the Spirit. But then there arises another problem, and it's twofold, a twofold problem. How can God, think about this, how can God justly punish his innocent son? That's who Christ is. Christ, is. Christ was perfect. Think about this. Christ never had a sinful thought. He didn't have a sinful human nature. He was born of the Virgin Mary, conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin. Remember the angel called him that holy thing? Wasn't being disrespectful there. What that, what that tells us is he's separate from anyone else who was ever born. Because when we're born, we're born fallen in Adam and spiritually dead in trespasses and sins. But not Christ. He was perfect. I don't know how to describe that. I don't know what perfection is. You know, Paul said that in Romans 7. I want to be perfect, but I don't even know how to do that. We're sinners, but not him. He was the innocent sacrifice. You remember how the lambs in the Old Testament, remember how it describes what they had to be without spot and without blemish? You know why? Because they were a picture of Christ who with his, in his humanity was without spot and without blemish. Now that can't be said of you or me. 
we got a lot of spots and a lot of blemishes, <laughs> inwardly and outwardly. We're sinners. <laughs> but he was the innocent sacrifice. So here's the question. How can a holy and just God rightly punish his son who was innocent for the sins of his people and still be just to do so? And think about it this way, too, on the other side of that coin. How can God justly save and justify, declare me forgiven and righteous, I who am a sinner, how can he declare me righteous by the righteousness of his son and still be just and true to himself? Well, the answer is found in this text. Look at verse 4 again. Surely he hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, you see that? Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Now that's how we by nature looked at him. Verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace. Now what that is, the punishment that it took to bring peace between God and sinners, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. Not upon you or me, but upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord made all the iniquity of all of his chosen people to meet on Christ. So here's the question. How did he bear? It says he bore our griefs. He carried our sorrows. How did he bear them? How did he carry them? Well, there's two ways that he did. According to the Bible. Number one, by a legal act of what you spoke of it, we sang of it. It's called imputation. I've got an article in the bulletin on the back. Read it sometime. The Blessed Doctrine of Imputation. Written by an old writer named Robert Hawker. In Psalm 32. The prophet David made this statement. He said, blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. Now I don't want you to raise your hand. Please don't raise your hand. This is a rhetorical question. How many of you have any debts at all? Everybody, don't we? We all have some debt. If you're not in debt, God bless you. <laughs> what does that mean? That means that that debt is charged to your account. Is that right? That's imputation. Sin, often in scripture, is portrayed like running up a debt. Like a criminal who commits a crime, and now we say he owes a debt to society, a debt to the law. He's got to do the time. He's got to pay the debt. That's imputation. That debt is imputed to him. Our debts are imputed to us. Well, we run up a sin debt. We fell in Adam, and we've sinned and sinned and sinned and sinned. We can't count them. Sin. And if we don't have a surety to take our debt upon his account, we owe it. And what is the payment of that debt? The wages of sin is what? Death. But before the foundation of this world, God chose a people and gave them to Christ. And what does that mean? That means he put all of the debt of their sins upon Christ. Christ became our surety. Christ said, put it on my account. I'll repay it. That's what he did. And all of my salvation was at that time, before I was even born, before this world was ever created, before Adam fell, all of my salvation was conditioned on the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 9 when he talked about the government was upon his shoulder. That's the government of salvation, the government of grace. Well, how do you know that he did that for me or for you? Well, do you believe on him and rest in him as your whole salvation? 
Because you see something else happen. Not only did Christ pay my debt by his blood on the cross, he worked out a perfect righteousness before God that has been imputed to me, charged to me. It's like somebody coming along to a bank and paying all your money debt and then giving you a million dollars to the good on your account. <laughs> That's what Christ did. He took my sin debt, paid it in full. Jesus paid it all. <laughs> and in return, he gave me his perfect righteousness. And that's called the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel. It's imputed to me. And that's how God could punish his son justly. He was, Christ actually became guilty. You read that Psalm 69 where he says, my sins. They were his sins, not because he committed them, not because they were infused into him or contaminated him, but because God had charged him with the debt of those sins. My account became his, and his account became mine. That's how God can justly condemn his son for my sins, laying on him the iniquity of us all, and that's how he can justly declare me forgiven and right in his side. So when the gospel is preached, it ought to drive us to look for and find a perfection of righteousness that can only be found in the Lord Jesus Christ and nowhere else. If you find it anywhere else, oh, God help you. And he won't. David said, blessed is, the Lord to whom the Lord, uh, blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. Paul quoted that in Romans 4, 6 when he said it this way. He, he got the positive. He said, blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputeth righteousness without works, so that we can stand with every true believer and say, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifies. Who can condemn us? It's Christ that died. Yea, rather is risen again. That's how he bore our iniquities. But not only was sin imputed to him, he had to suffer. That's the second way. By suffering all the pain and all the punishment due unto our sins. Whatever it took to satisfy God's justice, that's what Christ went through. And that's what he was doing. We esteem him stricken, smitten of God. That's our view of him by nature. We look upon him as a criminal, as a blasphemer. But when God the Holy Spirit gives us life, here's what we say. Oh no, he was wounded for our transgressions. <laughs> it was my sins. not his. They became his by imputation, but nowhere, no way else. He bore my punishment. He was crushed for my iniquities. That's why he went to that cross. And he did it to satisfy God. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. God was satisfied. It wasn't like, again, God was no sadistic monster. His justice had to be satisfied for him to save sinners like me. With his, and the chastisement, of that which it took, the punishment that it took to bring peace between God and his people was upon Christ. Colossians 1 says we are Peace was made by what? The blood of his cross. That's the cause of his sufferings. All of that. And so when 2 Corinthians 5.21 says he was made sin, how was he made sin? By the imputation, the charging of my sins to him. And when it says we are made the righteousness of God in him, how? By the imputation of his righteousness to me. Now out of that comes what? Life, for life everlasting. Spiritual life. The son of righteousness, Malachi said, comes forth with healing in his wings. I've gone too long and I'm sorry. I wanted to get to this verse 6 and I think I'll pick up there next week. But let me give you this to think about in closing. Verse 6. He says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Do you realize that that statement there, all we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, that is one of the most comprehensive and concise statements that describes the sinfulness and depravity of man. 
All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. Now, what way are you? What way am I on? If it's any way but the way, which Christ said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, the way of grace, the way of his blood, the way of his righteousness, the way of the cross, the way of mercy in him. If it's any other way, if you are one of his sheep, you're a lost one. If you die in that, you never were one of his sheep. You see what I'm saying? Think about that, and we'll pick up there next week. All right.